I appreciate the opportunity to come visit with you and uh, talk to you about, um, really brief you about uh, some important issues uh, at the university and in the state. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll essentially give you the same briefing that I've given the trustees and, and uh, friends of the university and the faculty and staff uh, regarding the budget and then let your questions drive the dis, uh, discussion. Let me uh, make two comments before we talk about the budget. It's really the, the budget situation and the state situation I want to focus on. Um, when you look at the core mission of any, uh, any university, but particularly uh, regional comprehensive universities like this in, in the country, uh, you really have to uh, construct that mission around the student experience and uh, the student learning experience. Uh, I, it's important for you to know that that experience and what happens to you here is uh, really foremost in our minds uh, and it is a multifaceted thing. It's not just about classes and your instructors. There are lots of factors that go into trying to determine what kind of experience the University of Wisconsin Green Bay will give. And we're uh, always seeking a little bit of an edge and trying to be a little different because we are in competition. Uh, but uh, if, as you listen and participate as we go through the process of making some fairly substantial reductions in our base budget over the next couple months, you may uh, see some things that seem to be odd or maybe don't coincide with what you think uh, might be the mission of the institution. Uh, and I would just encourage you to ask questions. There are a lot of interrelated parts to this, and, and, it's, uh, and so in order for us to have an experience here where you come out of here with the kind of skills and perspectives and uh, knowledge that you need, we've got to do a lot of stuff for you and about this educational experience outside of the classroom. And that extends to the way we interact with this community. So a lot of what we have to uh, manage in any change environment like this is how we interact with this community. We are a public institution. We do have other imperatives besides uh, education and one of them is to intersect with this community to support public education generally, to support economic development, to support social services. These are all part of our mission as well. So it's, uh, I just bring that up. Uh, to make sure you understand that there's just no simple way to talk about um, what we're doing in relationship to uh, any person's experience on campus. I do want to just mention briefly the uh, interdisciplinarity uh, phenomenon. Um, y this institution was uh, an innovation 50 years ago in its uh, organization around interdisciplinarity. Uh, it's important to appreciate that interdisciplinarity has been around forever and in fact has been a uh, key theme in, higher, in American higher education uh, since its founding and in fact uh, if you read my essay realized that um, even medieval um, education was interdisciplinary. So our claim to interdisciplinarity here <coughs> is in the way we've organized it uh, and that's very important to appreciate. Uh, the essay I wrote was intended to um, clarify in my own mind, my own thinking about uh, interdisciplinarity and primarily the way it's organized. Uh, of course, I support the whole concept and have uh, lived an interdisciplinary life. And so while that may be on some people's minds, that really isn't the issue. We're always going to be an interdisciplinary uh, university as part of our mission. Uh, but I am interested in how we pay for it and whether or not we're, we're delivering it uh, in a contemporary way because this is a 50-year-old model and right now in a time when we really have to look at everything we also have to look at the way we're organized with regard to that. So I would encourage you to um, to uh, to read the essay in the spirit in which it was intended. It's a thought piece. It's not a memorandum and it does not lay out an uh, any particular pathway uh, and it has generated some very rich discussion which is exactly what it, we needed to do and I will remind you that the uh, committee that hired me asked me to do that. 
So there was one of the, one of the things that they, they saw in looking at the university as we looked for a new chancellor was we really need to take another look at the way we have interdisciplinarity um, organized. And that's what we're doing. We're taking another look at it. So um, I appreciate uh, some of the passion around it, but um, uh, you can rest assured that we're not, uh, certainly not going to uh, make any wholesale changes to that ideal, uh, even though we examine the way we deliver it here. Now, let me tell you about the budget. Uh, we anticipated several months ago that the state budget would be um, more robust than it is now. In fact, the uh, university system of Wisconsin uh, offered a budget proposal, the Regents, Board of Regents did, uh, to the governor, oh gosh, back in late fall, I guess, uh, that asked for $94 million in additional funding for the system that would have been a net increase in the, the budget. This was not a um, uh, capricious or uninformed act. 42 states in this country have uh, turned the corner since 2008 and started to reinvest in higher education, uh, including, um, and that, those are states across the entire political spectrum. Some states with very conservative uh, political leadership have, have moved into reinvesting. Some states with less conservative leadership have done this. And I think there's a general sense around the country that uh, while there was some trimming necessary um, after 2008 because of the Great Recession and everybody had to trim, that now's the time to, to reinvest in higher education. So it was particularly disheartening to find Wisconsin is one of five states now this year who has uh, continued to decline in investment and this, this decline is a, is a, large, uh, a large one. Uh, so um, the governor, of course, is faced with the, the responsibility of balancing the budget and uh, making the first shot at uh, presenting a budget. So he has the obligation to fill a very large hole uh, in the budget and there are very little, I don't know if you know that much about state budgets, uh, uh, some of you probably do, but there are very few discretionary pots of money in state budgets. That is, you, uh, a lot of it is entitlement, a lot of it is um, a debt related to long-term um, projects like roads and so forth. A lot of it is Medicare. So there's, uh, there's not, not a lot of places to go if you, have, if you need funding. And so he proposed a budget that really has two parts to it. Uh, one is uh, a cut, uh, substantial reduction in base funding to the uh, university system. And the other part is a proposal to move the state of the Wisconsin system out of the being a state agency and into uh, being a state authority, sort of like the hospitals are arranged now in the state of I'll talk about both of those, uh, but um, let me say with regard to both of them that we're in a marathon here about both of these processes. The way legislation works, uh, the governor makes a proposal. Uh, that goes to the Legislative Fiscal Bureau, which is where it is now. That is a group that sort of vets it for um, various uh, conflicting laws and understands how it would work. It's not a legislative body. It's a, it's a kind of a consulting group that is part of the legislature. Their um, analysis of the budget will come out in a couple weeks and it'll say, it'll give us a little more detail about how things would work uh, in that budget, how the authority would work and so forth. Then that goes to the Joint Finance Committee, which is uh, both assembly and senators. There are 16 people on that committee. And they will basically build an alternative budget from, the, uh, from their thinking using the, the governor's uh, first approximations. And that's what goes to the legislature. So there's a lot of time between now and um, beginning of the fiscal year, months, a couple months, where there'll be a lot of intensive discussions about all of the details of the various budget. So I'm telling you what we know now and what we've been asked to do about this because we are in a situation of both being part of the discussion about the budget and planning for a worst case scenario of the budget. So those two things are important to us. 
Uh, generally, our university position is, uh, and in universities, the position of the university is the chancellor's position of the university. Our position is that we believe the authority has uh, incredible advantages with regard to flexibility, um, uh, a more uh, stable funding stream, a better chance at a long-term rational tuition policy, and most, and maybe, maybe as important as those, considerable um, deregulation in that we would be rele relieved of having to be regulated by the Department of Administration. And uh, I will say this about authorities. They're not new. The, they, they occur in many states. In fact, Wisconsin is very different than most states in that the, um, the rules about the institution, about the institution, are in the state statutes. That's very odd. In fact, it's the only state in the union that has rules about shared governance and tenure and so forth in the state statutes, Chapter 36. So what the authority idea is, is to take Chapter 36 out of the state statutes, give it to the board of the regents, which, which, which would become the, re, the authority board, and they would promulgate rules about the institution. And this is the way it is in most states. So it's not something new under the sun, it's just new in Wisconsin. The state would still have the authority of the, uh, would still be over the institution because that's where the constitutional authority is, uh, but there would be some distance between the legislature and the authority board, and uh, funding would be in a block grant, and the board would then work. Uh, this um, is, there are a lot of parts of the, the authority that are not known or they're not known to us, or they're still trying to be figured out, which makes sense. Like, and, and a lot of these are labor issues. They have to do with uh, what happens at retirement. These uh, people like me would no longer be state employees. We would be employees of the authority, like hospital employees. So uh, that all has to be worked out. And uh, there are several faculty senates around the system who've already taken a position against the authority because they're worried about what it would do to um, faculty rights and responsibilities. Our faculty is going to take up the issue on Wednesday, and that's perfectly fine uh, for them to do that. Uh, but I think there are just a lot of questions to be asked um, about that. It looks on first the way it was proposed anyway, it looks like a very favorable situation for employees, but um, uh, that's not, that still has to be determined. The authority would, would get bonding authority, for uh, which is now does not have, so that we could do revenue bonding. This is the way dormitories are built generally in the rest of the country. And uh, so we would be able to uh, do that and then any other kind of uh, revenue generating capital projects, then we would be able to, to work on, on those uh, with the authority bonding. We would still be connected to the budget, the capital budget. and. Um, the authority would basically rent the buildings from the state, a long-term lease. A lot of details like that need to be worked out. But again, I want to make it, I want to make the point, this is not something that's new under the sun. It's done this way virtually everywhere I've worked. So it's a, and it has a lot of advantages. Um, uh, but there's a lot to learn about it. The governor also proposed, and this is probably the part that we're most interested in right now, um, $150 million cut to the University of Wisconsin system. Now, I want to go forward from that $150 million, but I want to go backward first. Reduction in, in the funding for higher education in Wisconsin is, is uh, not new, and it's not a partisan issue. Uh, the, there have been reductions for the last two biennia, which is a bipartisan range. Uh, so for the last six years, money has been uh, taken out of, uh, or the appropriation to the University of Wisconsin system has increased, has continued. So it, it adds up to, I think at the number's around $600 million over six years, taken out of the system. Now this is a, this is a, a nationwide phenomenon. For about 15 years, states have been divesting in higher education. It's actually a little longer than that now. Uh, for those of you interested in the roots of this, 
I don't know the roots, but I can tell you there's a, there are a couple <coughs> corollary phenomenon to this. After World War II, public higher education in America really um, boosted the, the middle class into an educated class in America. This was primarily funded by the federal government and the states in concert. And you got a lot of colleges uh, created, public universities. There are 500, 5,000 universities in this country. There are about 750 public universities in this country. Uh, there are about 320 Division I public institutions in this country like we are. Those institutions historically were funded by the state. That is, and there were two reasons that they were funded by the state. Uh, and you could tell this in public uh, opinion polls of citizens in America. One reason was that people in America believed that if you could get a college degree, you were better off. And there's still a lot of evidence to suggest that, a lot of really strong evidence, actually, to suggest that even more so now than the other reason, though, that Americans wanted these colleges, and this is the reason you have so many of them, by the way, is that there was a very strong belief in the commonwealth value of higher education, that is, the undifferentiated community value of having a college nearby. So the idea was that having a bunch of smart people that were highly educated is good for society. Now, that second belief is no longer held by the majority of Americans. Uh, the Commonwealth uh, value of higher education is no longer something most Americans will say is a good idea. What most Americans say now is that the college degree, uh, the advantage of a college only accrues to the person who gets the degree. And it's about that time that states started divesting in higher education because the sort of view then became, well, if it's not a Commonwealth value, why should the state pay for it? At about the same time, tuition started to go up because the other part of the argument is, well, the people who get the degree should start paying more for the, uh, uh, and of course that's capped for political reasons. But if you look at, a lot of people will show you uh, tuition going up in the last 15 or 20 years. Ask them to show you the state support, which goes down in a commensurate way. It's almost, uh, it's almost the inverse of the function. So we're in a situation where we were at the end of that particular issue when the, when the Great Recession hit, and then everybody started to e even take more out of higher education because it's an easy step uh, to, okay, it's not a commonwealth good, so state government shouldn't pay for it. Some states like uh, Arizona and Louisiana took close to 50% out of their higher education system. Um, Arizona, 48, Louisiana, 45%. Wisconsin is in that group that over that period of time since the recession took about 22 percent of its funding back in, uh, from higher education. And now it's, like I said when I started, is one of five states that continued that because of its uh, economy. And other states have made the turn and have started to reinvest, 42 of those. There are only two states that did not uh, divest in higher education after uh, the Great Recession in 2008. Anybody want to guess who, which two they are? North Dakota and New Hampshire? Alaska. North Dakota and Alaska. Because of oil money. Uh, that oil, uh, new oil money. You would, you would think that would also have saved Louisiana, but it didn't. So, the money from the Wisconsin system has been, has been coming out for a while, and then we were down to uh, the last six years. So, the state funding for this university, the actual state appropriation that gets only funds about 17 percent of the university. And in many states, it's um, less than, a, than uh, 5 percent. So the, the way the university is funded is through a partnership. State funding, tuition, and then we raise money through auxiliaries to do other things like parking lots and things like that, and research and other. The problem is that the money that's appropriated to the state, to the state, really supports the labor pool in the university. That's where most of the people are paid out of. And this is a very labor-intensive operation. 
So $150 million was proposed to reduce the, from the system, this would be the largest single reduction uh, in the history of the system and one of the largest in the country. There, the actual cut is bigger than that, however, because it also includes discontinuation of the cost to continue, which is uh, the sort of the baseline cost, fringe benefits and stuff that go forward. That would be discontinued. And in the case of uh, University of Wisconsin Green Bay, there are two provisions in the in the uh, bill in the proposed pro proposed budget that are directly related to us that add up to three hundred thousand dollars. So uh, we believe that uh, the base cut would be about four million dollars to us, and if you add the cost to continue in, it would be about four point six eight million dollars. Uh, now, that's money that comes directly from the uh, state in their appropriation. It's about 15 percent of the appropriation we get right now from the state. It is two, over two times the amount of money we spend on supplies and equipment every year at the university. Um, so it is uh, a challenge. The way this works is you'll often, you'll hear this talked about as a $300 million cut. The reason for that is because of strange biennial mathematics. If you're looking at it from the legislative, from the state's point of view, they save 150 in the first year when they cut. Well, they save 150 again in the second year, but you really only have to cut it one time. So it's a $150 million cut. So even though we're in a marathon, where we would like that there will be discussions about making the cut smaller and there'll be discussions about the uh, the flexibilities related to the authority we have uh, because we're the i'm the fiduciary of this institution i have to plan to start operating on july 1st with 4.6 million dollars less than we have right now and that's what we're about doing and so uh, the way that we're doing that is uh, I'm going to try to um, um, sort of describe this uh, clearly. It's, it's kind of a sausage <laughs> deal. Um, but we are now very actively looking for places uh, that we can do without. That is, we just remove that program or that particular activity from the budget and uh, give this money back to the state or just not operate with them. We are looking for places where we could fund it for a period of time until we get into to a more favorable revenue environment or make an allocation to um, keep it or finally decide to make the cut. So we have uh, some uh, some capacity, not a lot, but some to to go ahead and take the cut, but carry the costs for a while until we can actually deal with it. One of the reasons that you would want to do that is that um, you presume the economy will swing back up and uh, we'll get into a better uh, revenue picture for the state, and you know you hope that happens in a couple years. So you try to keep. Um, maybe not an essential, but a critical function going using some flexibility that you have. Um, we're doing two other things, and this takes a little time, but these, these are investments. We've got to figure out how to grow this university uh, in some way. We've got to move into a growth mode. Here's the reason. Regardless of what your enrollment target is, and I think ours has been too low, but regardless of what it is, You've got to shoot above that, and you've got to shoot considerably above it all the time. That is, you have to always be growing because if you shoot at a target like enrollment, you're going to miss it half the time. So you always want to miss it on the upside because in this state, you keep tuition. Okay. And uh, so we want our enrollments to be strong, and uh, we need to get good students, but we need to make sure we, we uh, offer. So we've got to do that. Uh, the, um, so we have a, a uh, plan.
planning structure in place for this. We have the various constituent groups. There are four, this Senate, this, the classified, the um, university staff Senate, the academic staff Senate, and the faculty Senate have all um, appointed or uh, recommended to me to appoint uh, individuals to a university planning and innovation committee that sits in, uh, that meets with me every week. That group is a planning group. Um, every group is a planning group. All the decisions about the uh, budget and how to cut it are made by the fiduciary. That's me. And so we're trying to get as much good information and possibility and scenarios up to that position at that point as we can. So we have your group, the three other senates, they have people on the UPIC. We have the cabinet, which of course are the divisional leaders and they actually have all the money. Okay, that's where all the money is, is in academic affairs, student affairs and whatever. Um, we have um, our council of trustees group and I'll tell you a little more about their activities in a minute because they're generally outside but they do have a committee that sort of helps us internally. Uh, we have um, uh, various other, the uh, university committee, which is made up of the, of the, um, the leadership of the th what used to be three senates. We've now added people from the academic, from the university staff senate. Uh, we've called that the leadership group. They're involved, they're the, they're the group that's a senior advisory group to me about this issue. And then we have various other ways to get your input into this process through a blog that's on my webpage. You can email me directly if you want. I get a lot of emails. But what will happen is we're going to, through this process, push forward candidate ideas for reduction and work them through these various groups until we can build a consensus or get two hard, hard choices. We just may have to make some hard choices. We also have the Invent the Future process, which is coming to an end. I pushed it back and ask them to end that process sooner. Their four working group reports came out last week. They're fantastic. They have just fantastic ideas in them about how to uh, improve uh, life here at the university, make it more efficient, make us grow, things like that. So we're gonna, we're gonna be uh, socializing those ideas with the same group, the same groups, because there are certain organizational changes and some other things that they're suggesting that would really help uh, help us as we go forward. So all that will come to uh, various decisions. Now we're doing this in three phases. Between now and March 4th, which is really the week after next, we will, um, we're, we're basically preparing to talk to the, March 4th is the next Board of Regents meeting. It's a one day meeting in Madison. And at that point I've been asked, all the chancellors have been asked to say to talk to the, chan to the regents about what kind of effects this will have on your university. So we're working very hard right now to figure out what those effects will be in general terms. From March 4th till April 9th, April 9th is the next Board of Regents meeting, we'll be making preliminary decisions about reductions and running those through various groups like this one and others. The way that'll work is we'll just come to you and say here's what we're considering and we'll get all the feedback we can and then we'll just make a decision or we'll back off that one and try another. And then from March, um, uh, uh, from April 9th to July 1, we'll complete those decisions and implement them so that on July 1 we can operate with four million, four point six eight million dollars less in state funding than we're operating with now. At least our books will say we don't have that there. We may carry some things on other funding for a while. Where does this other funding come from? This is called our flexibility. You have seen in the paper, um, and this is part of the reason that we don't have tuition uh, now. Uh, various universities have balances in their books. The, this is money that was saved up for particular projects. For example, the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay has uh, more roads than anybody, any other campus except Madison. And we are the only university that has to take care of our own roads. So if you're over in Stevens Point, you're right in the middle of the city, they take care of the roads. We gotta take care of them. So part of our parking fees and other things go into an account. 
It's got millions of dollars in it um, to fix roads, and we've got a schedule to fix those roads. So we're looking at that account, and we're saying, can we push that schedule back? Can we, we, that also is where we get the money to plow them and things like that. So we're doing that. Uh, there are various academic programs that work on a program revenue basis. That is, it's, it's the tenure supports the whole program. A lot of nursing programs, social, social work, some others do this. They accumulate balances over a period of time um, in order to regenerate the program and take care of what they need there. We're looking at all those balances and asking, is that new program that they want to um, promulgate, can we put it off or can we just not do it? These balances, though, are one-time funds. They're not available year after year. They're, they're only, it's like you got 10 bucks. I can spend the 10 bucks, but when it's spent, it's gone. So if we use those monies to continue a process that has people and labor in it, we've got to eventually get, we're only putting off either a growth model or an eventual cut. So we're trying to ease it a little bit, but we're going to also make some changes. And we don't have a lot of that flexibility because we've used it over the last six years to do the same thing I'm doing now, is try to manage a cut through a period of time. Um, none of the reductions will affect student uh, segregated fees and the way you spend them. However, I will tell you that um, I will have conversations with you about the expenditure of those fees and how we work together as a partnership. Uh, this is something we'll do later. It's not part of the cut. But historically in, in Wisconsin, students have participated in the funding of higher education. You, you may not know this, but some of your t tuition goes to fringe benefits for faculty and staff. So because we have not had tuition in the system, there's a $50 million liability in fringe benefits there because that part of the partnership hasn't been in place. So I, I, and I've, t I've talked to the leadership about this uh, as we go through what we do with those fees and how we feed back on you. We're going we're to be spending a lot of time talking among ourselves and with you about student fees um, because I think it's important that we ration those and that we get out of it what we need uh, right now. And this is uh, actually going to be something that the whole system will be looking at. Uh, we have not uh, um, stopped student employment uh, because I know there are a lot of people in the university who, a lot of students who rely on employment. We have stopped hiring faculty and staff for now, at least the provost is making individual decisions, but uh, student employment has not been stopped and some of it actually may go up in that we may find ways for students to, to help us do things that we you know, <laughs> don't now have staff to do. So that should be. We have also not restricted student travel, um, particularly if uh, you have put money down and if it's planned travel, then we're looking at it to make sure there's a, there's a, interest, there's a good uh, um, educational uh, reason, but travel that's in the books uh, we're, we're letting that go. So it shouldn't affect your experience there. Uh, I cannot promise that ultimately class sizes won't go up. Uh, and we certainly hope that, although I, I hope this doesn't happen, we'll do everything we can to get classes offered in a timely manner. But we will see reduced staffing levels at the institution. We're not hiring. We have 20-some open lines now. In the fact, we're not hiring those people. That money will be lost. That position will return to the state and we'll have to make up the difference. This is a huge budget reduction for any institution, but it's, it's just huge. Uh, now, what are we doing about this? Um, let me be clear uh, about my position on this. Um, uh, anybody elected to public office has the responsibility to um, within whatever political views they take, has the responsibility to do what they believe is best for the state of Wisconsin, for the state. Uh, they're constitutionally obligated to do that. Uh, so this, and whatever you can say about policies that lead states to various economic conditions, and that's a debate you can have, the state is in a bad fiscal position. And the governor made a proposal that he believes will fix that. Uh, I, there, there are a lot of people who disagree with that approach, 
but the fact is he's governor and we are a state agency. And so we have to see these people as colleagues and I will do that. Um, I don't agree with all of it. I think the cut is too big. We certainly will tell them that. <laughs> but we're going to talk to them in a very professional way and in a, in a collegial way because we all have responsibilities to the state of Wisconsin. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it gets personalized. Uh, I, was, I think uh, you can see when that happens, in the, and I think that um, you know, sometimes you just have to rise above that. I, we will try our best, at least in my office, not to get personal. We will be very, very clear. And we have been. We are meeting with legislators every day. I met with a couple earlier this week. I meet with a few tomorrow. Our board of trustees, our, board, our council of trustees, you may not know, is an advisory group to the chancellor, is a very, very well-connected group in the state. They are organized. Uh, they have an advocacy, advocacy, advocacy committee. Uh, these people are um, well acquainted with uh, leaders in the state, and they are working to, uh, to make the uh, situation better. Uh, the system has uh, people in place that talk to le the legislative colleagues every day. And of course our senates, faculty, uh, academic uh, university senates and, and yours probably will have resolutions about their views about various things. So that's our approach. We don't like the cut. Uh, many of us can see a way around it. but. Again, we, we have to uh, operate as if we can get a creative solution of some kind. And we do that every day. Um, before I came here, I was with uh, two people who are very influential in the state, and we talked through the data. There are just differences of opinion about some of this. And so you have to kind of stay, it's like debating every day. And there is a lot of concern among state leaders <coughs> about the size of this uh, cut and, and the uh, size of, and the, uh, uh, authority. So uh, I'm just saying that that's what I'm going to do <laughs> and I hope that you will will also take that approach. I think we have a better chance to uh, to get a, a creative solution here. So that's my briefing and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have about any of it if you need to. Um, okay. Nate. Do you call on people or do I call them? Um, I'll make a speaker's list and then I'll go from there. So Nate's first. Okay. Here. At the student reps meeting a few yeah. weekends ago, uh, myself and a few others spoke right. with uh, Representative Billings as well as a public policy expert from uh, Illinois, yeah. admittedly not a Wisconsinite, but still very interested <laughs> in the UW system as a former, right. alum as a former alumnus. And uh, there was a lot of talk about the unfunded mandates going into this uh, proposed cut. Uh, could you uh, could you give us some details about those or elaborate on that? Well, yeah, the biggest one is the uh, the biggest one is the cost to con cost to continue, which at, is around twenty six million dollars. I may be wrong uh, for the system. That's taken out. That's historically always been. That's where you, they started. Here's the cost to continue. Everybody's employed, and we got the fringe benefits. Now let's see whether you get. So that's um, taken out. That's a huge part of the cut. You ask a really interesting question because um, in dealing with uh, people who are trying to manage this problem, one approach is just to say the cut's too big, help us out. Another approach is to um, actually make a suggestion. <laughs> And one of the things we're pushing on is that, you know, if you can get that back in there, that's a good start, you know, just get the cost to continue back in. For us, that's $600,000 here annually, annually. Um, the way the, the governor has suggested the authority money would come to, there would be a set of money that came to the system, and then it would be adjusted by the uh, CPI annually. And normally, over the last 10 years, that would have been a modest upward adjustment in every year, but I think three. But he doesn't start that till 2018, two by, you know. so you could say, well, let's move that back, do that a little earlier <laughs> and get to. And then there's the uh, elephant in the room, and that's tuition. And, uh, you know, 1% tuition increase. And by the way, the Board of Regents has the authority to raise tuition. It's just that a law was passed temporarily circumventing that authority. 
so it's not it's uh, so those kind of really difficult discussions would really help in the in the uh, situation. Hey Sierra. There's a lot of fear about uh, shared governance. Let me just uh, say this. Every region has said that they uh, strongly favor shared governance and tenure. Um, and for those of you who don't, under, uh, don't remember, recall the problem, if you take the, uh, right now in Wisconsin, shared governance is sort of ma is mandated in statute. It's the only state in the union where that exists. Go, go read it, though. It's very vague, and it's not a very strong. Actually, the one in North Carolina was much stronger. Um, so there's a lot of fear that if you make it an authority, all that will go away. It's not going to go away. It hasn't gone away in all 50 states. Every state that's tried to get away uh, to get rid of tenure, for example, has failed, and the reason they fail, and they will fail in Wisconsin, it has economic value. Go and try to staff University of Wisconsin Green Bay without tenure or Madison without tenure. You would pay four times as much to get the same quality of people there. You're just, it's, it, anybody who's tried to look at it has said, oh, okay, I get it, I get it now. It's not going to go away. And the, the, region has, the regions have said very strongly. Now, shared governance in higher education by nature is inefficient. That's one of the, that's one of the big beefs about, about higher education. But it is very, very important to the reflective part of this enterprise, which is the best higher education enterprise in the universe. And the reason that the enterprise works so well is that it's got that built-in sort of um, break and reflective pathway in it. So it takes a little more time. Uh, my vice chancellors and I uh, could make these cuts in, in three days. We're going to take months because of the shared governance process, because that's the way we work here, and it's very important that we work that way. So we all, you know, it's, this is not a, um, um, here's what I tell people, and they say, you're, you're not operating as a business. Um, first of all, we are a business in many ways. We have roads, we have a motor pool, we have a labor pool, we have uh, legal help, all, all that stuff. The difference is this, learning, which is the thing we do, is, cannot, is not gained by a business transaction. This ain't Walmart. You don't pay tuition and go buy an education. You gotta actually participate in it. <laughs> and so what you're getting is an opportunity to participate in, a, in an enterprise that is designed to do what nobody else can do in the world. Just think about this for a minute. You go home and get on your computer, you have access to the same knowledge I have the same opinions, same data. How, how, I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but I bet you're 20 years old. Our job is to get you through that morass into a position where you make uh, evidence-based judgments, that you, have, uh, you understand what good data is and what bad data is, you understand what hyperbole is and what it is. Okay. Nobody can do that better than American public higher education. And that's not the same as Walmart. <laughs> okay? It just isn't. You and I have to spend a lot of time together for you to actually leave with what, we, what you're paying to get. So, so I would tell you this. Shared governance will be here in this enterprise uh, uh, after an authority, uh, whether we have it or not, so will tenure. Student shared governance is often... Um, well, it's part of every system I've ever been in. There are two student, students on the Board of Regents. Uh, what's organized under that, I don't know, but I do know they have a voice. So I, I can get passionate about that. Read! Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, one, one subject that's come up is that 
okay, where are we actually going to cut? And, and I think every answer I've ever heard is really beat around the bush. And so our, without actually giving me a specific, can you say, are we just looking at across the board <laughs> academic departments, programs, and areas, and just say, sorry, that's the least important thing. That's what's got to go. Because it seems to me there's got to be some area that just needs to go away. Um, for example, you know, you had mentioned there's a, a personnel freeze. And I know um, in particular in my area, National Applied Sciences, they were starting into a, an engineering program. Mm -hmm. And they were in the process of hiring a bunch of professors and opening that up. So are we putting a hold on all new programs? Or are there specific areas that are going to get cut? And how much of that can you answer? For me? Well, by the way, all the engineers were hired. Um, I want them got his degree from Duke too. These are great people. Um, we are definitely not going to cut this across the board. We're going to we're going to suck it up and make the hardest decisions that we have to make. There will be programs that now that are not here next year. Um, and that the, the hard part about this is that you know this university has been cut so much it's hard to find anything that's not really important. Um, but we're going to have to or we're going to have to figure out a different way of working or both. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. We do have a candidate list of what they are. We're, we're you know, sort of moving it out. Uh, we know how much they cost. We know how much, uh, uh, what we don't know in some cases is if we really decide to keep it, we can't afford to pay for it, how long can we keep it going and what happens at the end of that. So that's what, that's what we're spending eight or nine hours a day <laughs> working on right now. Uh, but yeah, we will make some hard, we'll make some hard choices. Some, some of them will be really, really hard. Um, but they're just, I don't know what else to do in a $4.6 million budget, that's 15% of our state appropriations almost unheard of. And, and Are there any of, other questions? Stephanie. And then the new guy has, yeah. the newly elected dude has got one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, it, we'll have to look at uh, how close it is to the learning experience, how much of an opportunity there is for growth in it, um, and its relationship to, uh, and, and then there's about six other important things that, let me just tell you, well, let me just back up a minute and just, you, you should know something about public higher education in universities. Very few of the things we do make money. That is, we don't, if I took the um, state appropriation and the tuition going into most programs, I'm not, there's, I can't say we, we're making that run on its own. So, but we want to keep that because it's so critical to the liberal arts education or to the basis of accreditation or whatever we need. So a lot of, you'll hear a lot of fear about the humanities and areas like that because uh, some of these departments will never generate <coughs> enough enrollment to actually pay for themselves. But you still want it. And this is, the, this is what's so difficult about the accusation that you're not operating like a business. Why don't you just cut that? Well, the reason is I'm a public entity. You don't want me to cut that <laughs> because it, we need it to do all this other stuff, even though it's not cut. A good example is medical schools. Medical schools never make money. They lose money all the time. So if you were operating as a business, that'd be the first thing you cut loose. But you're a public entity. Nobody's going to cut their medical school loose. <laughs> okay? And, and so you, that's the way it is with a lot of our things. So when we're looking for cuts, we have to look for things that could possibly operate on their own if we bridged them for a while, or could operate more on their own if, we took le <laughs> if they took less money. But we can't look at things, uh, we can't use hard metrics like uh, enrollment data, um, solely to make decisions about, say, academic programs. Because it, it you would dismantle the whole thing. You'd be left with two big departments. 
and that's not what that's not the education that we're trying to give you so it's a um, it's a actually I, I really like this because I, <laughs> I hate having to do this but I'm actually uniquely trained to do this I'm, I'm um, I have a really high tolerance for complexity and because I'm trained as a um, an ecologist a mathematical ecologist I don't really need to know um, every path through a complex system I just need to know a couple and I have uh, have a lot of interest in secondary and tertiary connections to things when you make a decision here how it affects four different people you can work backwards so that's the way I see this this is a very complex ecosystem and you're you're focusing in on one species and we're deciding whether to cut it how does that change the whole ecosystem strategy and that's kind of sort of now we have a lot of analytics we're not just flying by the seat of our pants here we've got we've got various bits of data and so forth that we're working yeah, uh, Chet. I don't have an idea. <laughs> what I need is uh, what I, what I'm what I intended to do is to get people to have a discussion about it to figure out what the idea is. Um, I know how much it costs to do this. We have some idea of alternative organizations that really don't even affect the interdisciplinary majors or minors that are cheaper and maybe more efficient. But I do have concerns. They are expressed in my essay. One of them is that um, T-shaped individuals are uh, really the uh, those people are at a premium. Those people really, those, those ones that have a lot of depth in their uh, discipline before they branch out, those people really are the ones that are really succeeding in today's global economy. That's the people, people hire. I'm not sure we do that. My second concern is faculty research, which I think ultimately affects your education and is fundamentally discipline-based and funded that way everywhere and I'm worried about it I'm worried about us not doing enough of it that's another concern I have um, a third concern is that the organizational the way these um, units are put together that was decided 50 years ago the world's changed so those are my concerns but I don't have an alternative to it what we need is a discussion about an alternative to it and that's what we're entering and it's a scary discussion so there's a lot of heat about it but um, well, we're going to have it <laughs> because that was that was one of the things I promised we would do when I came okay, before yeah. we get back to Nate because I know he has another question is there anybody else who's not spoken yet that has a question what Nate has another question okay, oh. we'll go with, we'll go with Dude. Nick, okay, Nick Austin Nick uh, <coughs> thank you for coming out multiple times that you think this question is too big. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that you would support a smaller touch or a mid touch at all? <laughs> well, I'll say the same thing that uh, Chancellor Blank said at uh, many times in public, because I, I agree with her. We're a state agency, we're in trouble, we all have to do our part. I just think we're being asked to do more of it than we should, given the great impact of this university on the state and the country. So I don't have a number in mind, but. By the way, let me give you a little fact. If we took all of the administration out of this university, including the chancellor, we'd still owe them about three and a half million dollars. <laughs> Before I ask uh, that question, I'd like to thank uh, our students for coming out. I forgot to do that at the beginning, <laughs> but your interest in this is uh, vital because ultimately we as a Senate, uh, we do answer to you. And I'm sure that uh, Senator Hansen and Representative Genrick will face some of these same questions later tonight. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chancellor, 
uh, Green Bay that. was founded as one of very few uh, eco use, eco universities. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have, or how will that mantra, that drive, be affected? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, uh, like a lot of things, that uh, concept of sustainability and um, has changed. Uh, for example, it's much more a mainstream concept now in a business with triple bottom line thinking about, uh, and in fact, there are really good examples of that in this city. Uh, I've talked with the sustainability committee at length, and, and I think they agree, you know, we need to freshen that up a little bit and um, figure out exactly what it is that we, uh, as I understand it, in its original conception, it was more ecological, it was more about preservation and I'm not sure that's not still okay. I just think uh, it's something that we uh, can leverage. We don't want to lose that concept about us. So like everything else, you have to, um, at certain points in its history, take it on and try to refresh it. We've got some ideas about how to restructure the uh, kind of organization of that. Some of them got kind of usurped by the budget crisis, <laughs> but they're still there. So the idea is still there. I just need a little money to do that. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. So when you and I were uh, exchanging on your blog a little bit, I had asked about the effect on segregated fees, mm. and I think I've kind of been on the same page with you that I don't see a budget cut affecting segregated fees because they're just that segregated. Um, and <coughs> so you, you've told us today again that uh, this cut will not affect our fee structure. Uh, you know, then he added a little asterisk at, after that about how you may be interested in talking right. to us. Um, well, it, one thing I can tell you is that we don't have any balances, so we're not going to have to worry about spending down those balances. No, I, that, I would just like you to know more about, at, as, as we emerge from this um, Death Valley budget cut, the, the What's really of concern to me is that we have, what, what's left is a university that can prosper and grow, and have, so it'll have to have a strategy. I want you to know more about that strategy. And, uh, and I want to get into a discussion with students about how uh, assessing themselves fees moves us along in some way, or doesn't, you know. And, and at least so we know what the landscape of uh, agreement and disagreement is on that. That's all I'm talking about. We, we can't. I would never consider uh, sweeping those anyway, but um, I don't see the fee structure changing. I just think next fall, we get through this, we might want to spend some time with the leadership saying, here's where this university's going now. You know, what are your thoughts about how you can um, either redirect or reassess or rethink about how fees are used? That's all I'm talking about. I mean, you got you, you've been a partner ever since the university's been in play, and so you, uh, I just want you to be a full partner. I just want you to know where we're going, so you know, it's like, we can all go there together. Because the, to those assets that you have, if they're used in a segregated way um, only, won't um, have as much impact as if we decided to uh, use them together with some supplemental funds or something and do something big. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, Hannah. Hannah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, you had spoke a little bit about um, raising our recruitment rates and targeting for a higher number, but have you given any thought to maybe a grant down for Yeah. Yeah, we, we've talked a lot about that. There's a lot about the retention rate in um, the work group report from the Invent the Future process. Um, we, you know, we have higher retention rates here than a lot of universities have anyway. Um, but that's clearly important to us, retention rates. Um, and I don't want to retain people because they're not getting courses they need to graduate. <laughs> but, uh, you know. but yeah, there's a lot of thought to that. Are there any more questions for Chancellor Miller from anybody? These are great questions. Y'all been really kind. Read. Just a quick yeah. one. You had mentioned the um, 
the Invent the Future committees mm -hmm. that reports are going to be coming in. Are those going to be available or published in some way? Oh, yeah. Right now, they're, they've completed the reports, and the steering committee has agreed on the draft of their summary. And then once that's agreed on, I'm going to give all four of the Senate's copies of the four reports and the summary and the UPIC and ask you to um, work them over and tell us which ones of which of these ideas, there are a lot of ideas and recommendations in there, which ones really resonate with you. And there's some really good ones, um, and which is what we wanted, a catalog of innovations that we could sort of pick, pick apart. So there will be a lot of work on that but uh, that'll probably not come out till next week. They're still working on their final summary, I think. So then as a follow-up to that, what is it that we as a body can do to help you and move through this process? You know, I think uh, you, you have voice uh, with your legislature, uh, legislators, and I think you ought to use it. <laughs> um, uh, I, th I, I do think uh, they listen to students. I think it's better if you can talk to them personally uh, or on the phone. Um, they uh, don't particularly like, uh, form letters are not particularly helpful if you, but I think if you have something to say to them and you feel strongly about it, uh, you should, you should say it. You don't have any restrictions like faculty does unless you're an employee of the university. And let me just tell you, if you work for the university, you cannot use your work email to send an email. But if you're just, a, if you're a non-working student or you don't work for us, then you're like any other citizen. You can do whatever you want to. Uh, and I would, uh, I certainly think an organized uh, response from this group is very powerful. Um, we're going to continue to talk about it. It is a marathon. It will take a while. I think you can't just pass a resolution and hope it happens. You got to kind of follow it and keep talking to them and keep talking to them and go back and go back and go back until you, you know, we were back here last month. Remember we talked about this? We still haven't seen any movement. Can we talk about it again? And that would be helpful. Uh, that'd be helpful. And if you do disagree strongly with the approach we're taking, then I need to know that too, because we may just choose to disagree. Um, but um, at least we'll know it. And when somebody says, well, you and your faculty don't agree on that, I'll just say, yeah, we know. That's not the point. The point <laughs> is that uh, uh, we'll, we'll do that. <coughs> 